1977, a small factory in Colvin Leicester got to work on something that would change the lives of countless people. Little did they realise that people were still care enough 40 years later to sit and listen to a guy waffle on about that product. This is the Star Wars Toy Podcast. Hello there, and welcome to the Star Wars Toy Podcast episode 27. I am Darth Mark, and on this week's podcast, I am going to be talking about vintage play sets. But before that, we're going to have this. The Star Wars Tracker Report. So if you listened last week, I said I'm going to put a poll up on Twitter uh, asking if you still want this tracker. Uh, I don't get a lot of feedback about this podcast. I don't get a lot of listeners, to be honest with you. But uh, the feedback I do get is very positive about the Star Wars tracker. I did put a poll up and I got unanimous decision, 100%, saying that that you want to keep it. And I'm going to keep it in its current format. If you've got any idea whether uh, I could improve on this segment, please let me know. But as we know, we get the weekly emails. I got it a bit late, so I was uh, a bit worried whether we are going to actually get a Star Wars tracker anyway. But uh, Jared has put this. Card back variations matter to card and figures and collectors. There is no better example on of this than to look at the number one entry this week. Otherwise, I'm assuming to most collectors, the Kenner 65E card back is often brushed away as nothing special. However, the Emperor Anakin offer combination is very rarely seen on only a, f- a handful of figures when it does emerge. The Leia Bush example attracted a solitary bid, but for a hefty price, $7,500. And to the right collector, this is their dream piece. To many others, they may wonder what was all the fuss is about, thus illustrating the great diversity our hobby caters for. And we'll get to that one in a bit, but we're going to stop, start off as we always do with the top five accessories. So, number five, we have a Sykes Nautils and the Max Rebo Band UK G80. Kenner, it was loose. Sold in the United Kingdom for £225. Wow. I know it's graded, but that's not even boxed. On to number four, we have an Imperial Shuttle. Kenner, Return of the Jedi A. Emperor Arrival Scene, sold in the United States for $305. Number three, we have Millennium Falcon, Kenner, Return of the Jedi A, Luke Jedi Tatooine Scene, sold in the United Kingdom for £240. Number two, we have a Rancor AFA 75, Kenner, Return of the Jedi A, Cave Scene, sold in the United States for $330. But at number one, what we're talking about this week a playset, it is the Cloud City playset, Kenner Empire Strikes Back A playset with four figures, sold in the United States, $405. So on to the top five loose figures now. And number five, we have the, our favourite, the Arto D2 pop-up lightsaber, Kenner, sold in the United States, for $396. Those are just rising and rising. At number four, we have a Yak Face, UKG85, Kenner, United Kingdom, £311. They're sinking quite a bit. Um, at number three, we have another Yak Face, UKG85, Kenner, sold in the United Kingdom for £325. Two on the same day, both UKG. Hmm, that's a bit strange. But on to number two, we have a Droids version C3PO. Kenner, sold in the United States, $550. But at number one, we have the good old blue snaggle toe with no dent, FA85. Kenner, sold in the United States, for $770. On to the top five mock figures now. At number five, we have Sam People, Tuscan Raider, Solid Cheeks, FA80. On a Kenner, Star Wars 12C card, sold in the United States, for $880. Number four, we have... An R2-D2, Solid Dome, AFA-80, Kenner, Star Wars 12C card, sold in the United Kingdom for £800. And number three, we have an Imperial Stormtrooper, AFA-80, Kenner, Star Wars 12B, sold in the United States for $1,076. And number two, we have C-3PO, AFA-80, Kenner, Star Wars 12B, sold in the United Kingdom 
for £900. And there we go, number one, Princess Leia Bush disguise, AFA 80Y Kenner, Return of the Jedi 65E. As I said, it was sold in the United States for $7,500. So there you go, that's your Star Wars tracker again for this week. And if you want your very own Star Wars tracker, go to www.starwarstracker.com. Penny for your thoughts. In 1977, Bernie Loomis, president of Kenner, decided to make the Star Wars action figures three and three quarters tall. That decision caused a revolution in the toy industry, and action figures were actually made 12 inch or 8 inch tall. The new size meant that the figures could be offered for a reasonable price and in that the line they could also include spaceships, vehicles and playsets. Playsets have always been an important part of the toy industry from those from the Louis Marx toy line to the Mego sets in the 1970s. With Star Wars, Kenner produced some of the most memorable playsets ever. Rivaling classics such as the Castle Grayskull from Masters of the Universe and the G.I. Joe USS flag. Now, as I've mentioned before, uh, grew up um, well actually penniless but uh, there wasn't a lot of money about shall we say I did get my pocket money every week and used to buy a figure but funnily enough I didn't actually ask for any large play sets or vehicles for Christmas or anything like that I think I used to go for quantity not quality but the lack of a good play set never stopped me from uh, playing with my figures and imagining them in the rebel base or anywhere like that. I did actually make a lot of my own uh, background scenes and dioramas for the action figures to play in. I think there's actually only a couple of these places I do remember from childhood. I remember the uh, Darth, Darth Vader's Star Destroyer, which never looked like a Star Destroyer, but we'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, the Droid Factory, which I actually got given. So not having these playsets didn't detract from my childhood playing. Um, I do like them now i would like them a lot of them i did buy the dagobah one recently which i've been looking for for a few a number of years now but let's go through the list of the numerous play sets that were available starting in 1978 one of the coolest kenner play sets was one of the first to be released the death star space station was packaged in a rectangular box showing two kids enjoying the wonders of the imperial technological terror Kenner's vintage boxes were excellent sources if you were interested in the hairstyles and clothing of the 1970s. This towering Death Star is 20 inches tall and features four floors of action. An elevator goes all the way up to the top, uh, where Ben Kenobi can shut down one of the tractor beams. The top floor also has a large clicking exploding CB920 laser cannon under its roof. The cannon features a seat for one character, but unfortunately, the Imperial Gunner f figure would not be released until 1985. And until then, it was up to the Stormtroopers or Death Squad commanders to take the vacant seat. The third floor resembles one of the many Death Star hallways and has a retractable bridge for allowing Luke and Leia to make another swing across the chasm. The set even comes with a small black plastic cable that Luke can tie onto. And this item, surprisingly enough, is often missing. The second floor looks like the tension block AA223 with two consoles and an escape hatch that leads into the coolest feature of the playset, the Trask Compactor. The compactor is a small orange box with a transparent plastic windows. It is filled with coloured pieces of foam and it also has an exclusive Dinoga creature. The green Dinoga looks a bit weird compared to the latter depictions of the tentacle creature but you just couldn't get one anywhere else. The trash compactor actually works and uh, can push one of the walls towards the door. The hatch opens just in time and the heroes are once again being rescued. This place is so large, it was one of the biggest in the Star Wars line, that many countries didn't import it or produce it. Instead, they chose to release a cheaper but fantastic cardboard Death Star. Only Canada released both the space station and the cardboard Death Star. This cardboard playset was published by Palatoy in the UK, Meccano in France, Owen Toys, Kenner Canada, Throws Sears, and Toll Toys in Australia and New Zealand. The cardboard desk style was packed in a rather flat box resembling a board game. The box actually showed the rare vinyl cape Jawa, even though it did come out in 1979. The back of the box had several features of the playset, including the trash compactor, escape chute, and laser cannon. 
The pallet toy set was made of cardboard, while the one from Tall Toys was made from a sturdier chipboard. The cardboard Death Star is a large semi-sphere. It almost has 10 different rooms, a ladder, a bridge, and a long chasm, built into the centre of the two levels of the play value. On top is a seat with the two X-Wing laser cannons and a transparent can canopy to seat figure. The only other true action feature in this is the escape chute that leads to the trash compactor that can be opened and closed, simulating the moving walls and the heroes who are escaping. The cardboard walls are beautifully illustrated and you can easily recognise which rooms they are meant to represent. There is a large docking bay, a control room and even Princess Leia's cell. Although it looks like a rather simple playset, it's certainly one of the best Star Wars playsets ever. The Death Star Space Station is more specific features from the movie, but it offers more room for imagination. And of course, the cardboard Death Star isn't an easy playset to find, and certainly not in good condition. Uh, it's got too many plastic pegs that hold the cardboard walls into place. Parts of the laser cannon are often missing, and the cardboard itself needs to be in good condition as well. And a similar looking playset was also developed for Action Force and a range of European action figures initially based on Action Man and later used to introduce G.I. Joe toys to the European market. Next up we're going back to 1978 and the Cantina Adventure set. This cardboard set was sold through Sears in the Christmas catalogues of 1978 and 1979. The set is infamous for including the blue Snaggletooth figure which was soon replaced by a smaller, regular Snaggletooth. It didn't just include the tall Snivillian, but the other Cantina aliens as well. Walrus Man, Hammerhead and Greedo. The Cantina adventure set is nothing more than a cardboard backdrop and a base of Moss Eisley. It comes with several plastic pegs to pose your action figures. The backdrop shows a sand trooper, a weird droid, an alien resembling Garindan, and possibly the entrance to the Cantina. The Cantina Adventure set was produced to sell new Cantina figures and while it offers a very cool environment for tattooing, it's not that spectacular. And today it's one of the most difficult play sets to find in unused condition. In 1979 we get what is surely the Star Wars play set's most exciting name, The Land of the Jowers. The set consists of a plastic base, a cardboard backdrop of the sand Crawler and an exclusive Classics Escape Pod. Jetsoned by R2-D2 from the TAN-TV4, the base features an action spot where you can launch figures, simulating combat, Odacha ambushing R2. There are tracks of the sand crawler and there is also a small cave that you can use to hide smaller figures like R2-D2 or the Jowers. The sand crawler fits into the base and though it's made from cardboard, it has a crude elevator and some kind of shelf where a couple of figures can be stored. The escape pod is unique to this set and has an opening hatch, so you can make sure that 3 Pure gets his mission time and time again. The base of this playset would later be reused for two other Star Wars playsets. It's also important to add that Palatoy released its own Land of the Jowers. With a few differences, it doesn't feature the escape pod. The plastic base was a brighter colour and is made from a thinner plastic which is supported by sturdy cardboard. It also comes with two circular stands and one weird looking action feature, replacing the missing action feature on the plastic base. Though the pallet toy set comes with less accessories, it succeeds in capturing the desolate landscape of Tatooine. Uh, again in 1979, uh, Kenner had a second cantina in as many years with the Creature Cantina action playset. The playset consists of a plastic base and a cardboard backdrop. The base has a bar, a table, two action levers and many pegs for the figures. A figure can pretend to be the bartender as the levers simulate the classic he doesn't like you moment. The playset also has the doors uh, that spring open when you press a button and the backdrop shows part of the drink dispenser and several container residents. Few actually resemble the clientele from the new, A New Hope. We can see a few aliens resembling Juros, a couple of Jawas and six members of the modal nodes who are beautifully drawn. And in 1978 this set was also used in Kenner's Real West line as the Western Cafe playset. Again Palatoy also released their own version of the Cantina in the UK. 
Basically, it's the same playset, but it does have several differences. The bar is lower, the action levers are missing, and the right side of the playset is a bit different. And it's a bit taller. A sticker on the bar shows several bar stools, and the doors are also different. Just like Palatoy's Land of the Jowers, it comes with a strange loose action feature. Again in 1979, we have the Droid Factory. Yes, I've mentioned it earlier, and this playset looks lo nothing like from all the movies, and it's a combination between a playset and a construction set. For a change, there was no child featured on the main photo out of this box. Instead, it was seen on the smaller photos on the side. The base consists of a ramp and a large movable crane. The Droid Factory comes with 33 interchangeable parts, used to create a myriad of different droids. The most important one is Auto Dito, with three legs. And that is why I thought it was a knockoff one that uh, wasn't legit, because I'd never seen a three legged R2. This playset was the only way to get R2 with the central smaller leg. A booklet was included with blueprints for building all the Jawa monster droids. The droid factory is very difficult to find complete in lowest condition because there are so many different and small parts, including orange tubes and thin metal rods and plastic pegs. The base and crane would be used later for Jappa's Dungeon playset. Of course, we in the UK have our own Droid Factory playset, thanks to Palatoy. This Droid Factory looks completely different from Kenner's. It doesn't feature a crane or a ramp, but instead has a conveyor belt. The plastic base comes in dark blue, orange, orange, yellow. The different parts are nearly the same from the parts that came with the Kenner set. So long came 1918 with it, it was a new film, meaning brand new play sets. So first up we have the Hoff Ice Planet Adventure Set. Not play set, adventure set. The first thing to notice about this is the kid on the box is gone. And we can now only see an arm and a hand operating the off action levers on the set. This play set is the same as the Land of the Jowers. It features the same plastic base, now painted white, an action lever with a small cave. Instead of the Carbog Sandcrawler, they set as a weird looking cardboard attack walker with the same crude elevator. The escape pod is replaced by a 1.4 FDP tower laser cannon. Often nicknamed Radar Laser Cannon. Beware of the fact that this cannon is different from the Radar Laser Cannon can are released separately as an accessory stroke mini rig. The cannon in this set is much smaller and doesn't explode. An experienced toy daring dealer might try to trick you by including the regular laser cannon in this set. Next up we have Cloud City. This playset can be compared to the Cantina Adventure set. Its packaging is a small box and is sold by Sears in the US and Canada. The set came with four figures, Han Bespin, Lobot, Dengar and Ugnaught. Though in Canada some other figures were offered on this playset. Cloud City is a small but very cool representation of the city in the clouds. This cardboard represents a hallway and the torture chamber with the metallurgic scan grid used to torture Han in the Empire Strikes Back. It also shows part of this carbon freezing chamber and has an opening on top of it. This opening most likely represents the carbon freezing pit. The backdrop shows several tall spires and buildings of Cloud City and Storm 4 Cloud Car passing by. Despite being nothing more than a cardboard backdrop with the base, the Cloud City playset looks awesome and it is as unique as being the only best bin playset Kenner released for the 3 3 quarter series. There were plenty of opportunities to create cool playsets of Cloud City, but Kenner probably had begun to develop plans for the upcoming Micro Collection series that included the entire Bespin world. Unfortunately, the, that magnificent line failed and already ceased to exist in 1983. Next up, we have the aforementioned Darth Vader's Star Destroyer action playset from 1980. This one has always been a bit of an ugly playset, not because it's a bad playset, but probably because the Star Destroyer is a vehicle, more than a playset. I mean, the Millennium Falcon could be classed as a playset as well as a, a vehicle. But uh, those arguments will go on and on and on. And another thing is, this uh, playset doesn't look like the Executor at all. The toy can roughly be inter interpreted as the bridge of Vader's Super Star Destroyer. The box has an ominous reddish who. And it shows Boba Fett, Bosk and IG-88 standing on the ship playset. 
That picture on the box does show the same and even adds Dengar. And on the back of the box, you can spot a lot of action features on the set, explained by black and white artwork. Another issue that makes this set rather odd is the most features never appeared in the Empire Strikes Back. The general layout of the place that re resembles the command bridge of the Star Destroyer. Uh, there are two crew pits on the side of the elevated central ledge. Many pegs are presented to pin down your figures. Both pits have a blue door leading to nowhere. And uh, the back of the ship playset. The elevator part does present one action feature straight from the movie. Vader's meditation chamber. One figure, usually Vader, can be seated inside the pod. Which can light up and can emanate a reddish light. Though Vader isn't the easiest vintage figure to sit down properly, it is a cool feature. The other thing that hails more or less from the movie is a rotating platform where Vader communicates with the Emperor. The communication device in the set is a weird red plastic curtain that can be slipped into the ceiling of the ship. The back of the box has interesting information about it as it says that Vader uses this device to communicate with the Grand Vizier. This info hails from an earlier draft where Sage Pastage used later as the expanded universe warns Vader about the Emperor's incoming message. Proof of this can be found from the official collector's edition of Empire. The next action feature is just as weird. There are two pegs on the ceiling that allow you to hang your figures upside down. Did Vader have a Wumper as a pet inside his Star Destroyer? The box even shows a Death Squad commander figure hanging upside down. The best exclamation for this is that there's supposed to be some kind of containment field, like the one seen on Genosis to capture Obi-Wan. Another strange but nonetheless cool feature is an escape hatch. One may wonder where it might lead to, but escaping is something your rebel fi figures always had to do. The large laser cannon in front of the ship can be rotated, with the kid's arm fixed perfectly underneath to fly the Star Destroyer around the room. Terrorising family members by the dreaded Imperial threat. Darth Vader's Star Destroyer play set may not have the features from the movies, but it's still a neat Imperial set and can house a lot of your stormtroopers and commanders. On to 1981 now, but back to Hoth with the Imperial attack base. This is the second play set of Hoth on our call sheet. Once again, something doesn't sound right. It, why are the Imperials hiding in the trenches on Hoth? Is this Vader's Fortress of Solitude? This set surely was inspired by the events on Hoth, but the playset itself came from the imagination of the designers at Kenner. The name implicates that the Imperials are attacking, while the box sh shows the Imperials defending the base against the rebels. In France, this playset was released while the Tonton wasn't yet available, causing parents to go on a wild banter chasers trying to locate the elusive snow lizard toy. Despite its awkwardness, this is a very cool playset, and it's got an exploding ice bridge, an exploding command post, a figure can be launched to simulate another explosion, and a rotating and clicking cannon can be manned by a figure. The effect of the snow on the plastic base is nicely enhanced by footsteps, and the Imperial attack base may not be derived straight from the Empire Strikes Back. It's designed to hurt a great toy. Uh, if you find it in love's condition, you may want to check out all the pieces of the command posts are included. Another playset from the ice world of Hoth is the turret and probot playset, again in 1981. But this time it is the Rebel Alliance's base. It comes in a box shaped similar to the one of the attack base, but this time the Imperials are charging the Rebels. This playset is also pretty straightforward. It's got a plastic base and lots of pegs on one side, and a large white stick poking out of the snow to house the probot. Han and Chewie can discover it, and the probot can be destroyed by pulling an action lever. The set was only way that you could get the probot figure, which has moving arms and a removable head. The turret, technically known as the Golan Arms DF.9 Anti-Inventory Laser Battery, yeah, you'll try to say that, is also removable and has an opening door, an opening hatch, and it clicks when turned. Personally, I've always thought the turret looked really cool and a perfect way to represent the Echo Base defences. Kenner could have improved the playset if they had chosen to make the pull of the Probot removable. It now always sticks into the playset and that sure looks strange if you want to position your Probot elsewhere. Let's get away from Hoth for a while now and let's look at my very favourite Digabot action playset. Brought out in 1981, 
an entire planet turned into a single playset. Kenner released a few different boxes for this playset, and in 1982 they also included a Jedi training backpack for Luke to carry Yoda around. The box shows the features on the side. The Dagobah one a compact playset built on top of a plastic brownish base. The base is really detailed and you can see some small sculpted critters like a frog and a lizard. One of the Kenner designers even edged the name of his daughter into the set. Yoda's home is a central piece of the playset, just like the movie. It's got a low ceiling and it's got a table. For Yoda, his size is just fine and it would be cool if Kenner had chosen to make the tree removable. It might have been easy to position your figures inside the tree. Outside the tree, you can recreate several of Luke's adventures on the bog planet. There's a small swamp you can use to swallow your figures. The foam that you use to simulate the swamp will probably have deteriorated by now. Mine hasn't. The effect is simple but awesome. Another feature is a lever that holds Luke so that I can stand upside down with the order on top of his feet. Or even use the force to levitate himself. Two supply cases or even R2-D2. A lever cleverly disguised as a rock will cause two small poles to move. The two cases and a small cylinder for R2-D2 are included in the set and will be the pieces you'll be looking for in a loose action Dagobah playset. The last feature is found on the side of Yoda's home, the Domain of Evil, where the dreamlike confrontation between Luke and Darth Vader took place. The two figures can be put on separate platforms and he can move to recreate the duel. Dagobah is a unique playset, but according to the story, you just can't use a lot of figures with it. It would make little sense to use a man of man, General Mardine, or Lumat on Dagobah. And back one final time to Hoth for the Rebel Commander Center Adventure Set. Again in 1981, this was the third playset exclusive to retailers. Sold by Sears to sell action figures. The others were the Cantina Adventure Set and the Cloud City. The box shows the play options of the set, which are few. The Rebel Command Center is the last play set to use the plastic base of the Land of the Jowers play set. And once again, it's a little cave with an action feature used to launch figures. The new element in this set is a nice carton background showing the North Hangar 7 of their co base with the Millennium Falcon. The artwork also shows a Tauntaun with a rider and several T 47 snow speeders, a Rebel base transport, and X Wing Starfighters. On the bottom of the small cave you can now also see a small amount of weapons and accessories which are part of the cardboard backdrop folded underneath the playset. The three figures included in this set were Luke, Hoth, Gear, Ato D2 uh, with sensor scope and the Attack Commander. The Rebel Command Center may be a simple playset but it's not that easy to find. On to 1983 now and that means Return of the Jedi and the Ewok Village action playset. Now this is one of my favourites. Uh -huh. um, not everybody's favourite Ewoks, but the this you must admit this place is absolutely fantastic. It's one of the Kenner's last sets, and it's also one of the largest Star Wars play sets, the Ewok Village. The rather large box highlights the options on this set. When this set was released, there was only two Ewoks from Bright Tree Village were available: Chief Chipper and Logre. Neither were Han Solo, Trenchcoat, or Luke Skywalker in Battle Poncho. That's why you can see Han Best being a Luke Jedi Knight on the box. The Rare Chai Logo edition of this playset does show more Ewoks, T-Bone Wicket, and also Han Trenchcoat. Though without his coat, the Ewok village consists of three plastic trees that function as pillars for the village central meeting square. The wooden structure of the Ewok village is well created with a lot of detail. The meeting place has three fences, a drum, a fire with a spit roast uh, for an Ewok dinner. And the playset also comes with C-3PO's golden dirty chair that can be carried by two Ewoks. And there is way more. The trees have each have their own action feature. One tree has an actual hut that you can use your figures and the opening in the top. And you can also use to position figures. The second tree has an escape passageway that leads to the bottom of the playset. The last tree features a working elevator that carries figures from its central meeting place. Two more play options can be found on the floor of the playset. The first one is a swinging plastic boulder attached to the large tree and used to repel invaders. The last feature is a net underneath the central square. 
You can pull this net to the ceiling of the village square and it is actually able to, to trap several figures. Just like in the movie when Chewie was thinking too much with his stomach. The Ewok village is not uncommon, but it does feature more than 20 accessories. Therefore, it is difficult to find looks and a complete. The Ewok village playset was re later reused as Sherwood Forest playset in the Rubbed Hood Prince of Thieves Thailand from Kenner. But that one got a different colour and it was a lot of greens on top of the trees. And even Lego's recent Ewok Village playset seems to be an homage to the Kenner playset. The final vintage playset came out in 1983 and 1984. The Jabba the Hut Dungeon Action playset. Another Sears playset was the Jabba the Hut Dungeon that renews the plastic base from the Kenner Droid Factory playset. The base was painted grey, but it still had a slightly modified modified crane and the holes in the base of the droid parts have disappeared to create a more realistic looking dungeon. Quite frankly, the playset doesn't look at all like Jabba's dungeon. A dungeon designed like the one in the movie was planned to appear in the Mako collection line, but due to the unfortunate failure of the series, it never made it past the prototype stage. The dungeon playset came with Nikto, 8D8, uh, Klaatu Skiffguard. But one year later, Sears re-released another version of the set. The base was now painted in a tank colour and included the figures of VV99, Barada and uh, Manaman. Two different boxes were made and the 1984 edition is more difficult to find, uh, especially because the three figures that came with the, the version are a lot harder to find than the previous ones. Well, I hope you enjoyed our look back at the vintage play sets from Palatai, Kenner, all the licenses around the world. Uh, it's a big thanks to StarWars.com for the article I read out there. So what's your favourite playset? And why do you think they've stopped making them? Granted, there's no 3 and 3 quarter figures anymore, but maybe we may see one on the vintage collection sometime soon. Uh, I think the last one we got before the solo one was the uh, BB-8 one, which uh, didn't fare too well. I think people mainly bought it for the BB-8 and not the playset. So I'd like to hear from you about your favourite playset. You can find me on Twitter at Star Wars Toy Pod, or email me blueharvestvintagetoys at gmail.com. So until next week, where we'll have some more Star Wars toy goodness, I will say, may the toys be with you. Just one more round, friend. Then homeward bound. Just one more song, friend, and then so long, friend. The nights get shorter, it seems. Just one more rhyme, friend. Yes, it's a crime, friend. But you know time, friend. Time can fly. So it's good night, friend. Good night, but not goodbye.